Yeah, so hey, everyone. Welcome to the last session, as Pedro mentioned. Um, so this session is kind of going to summarize all the things that we've seen in our previous sessions today, right? Kind of wrap up how do we, you know, like take all of these troubleshooting best practices and, you know, tools that all of the other session presented and kind of summarize them here, right? Again, as Pedro mentioned, we'll be using the Dataflow runner as the runner for this session. So I think without further ado, let's uh, get started. So in today's agenda, we're going to be covering uh, like the first two best practices are mostly around setting up, right? Because one thing with the Dataflow runner is running with Dataflow means that there are a few different things in the cloud that need to be configured to you know like have your code ready to run. Right, so uh, you want to make sure that these are uh, ready and taken care of. I think in the previous session we might have spoken about you know failing to start the pipeline right after building. Uh, this like these some these best practices are things that cover that aspect of the failures or that we commonly see. Right, we'll finally wrap up with a couple of uh, you know common beam messages, error messages that we see in these beam pipelines, and you know what they might indicate and how do we want to. Uh, along with like best practices on to, to avoid them or to mitigate them as you see them. Okay, so starting with permissions, right? Uh, when you think about the Dataflow runner, there are three different like uh, credentials that determine whether your Beam pipeline can be launched on Dataflow, right? So the first credential is the user role, right? So when you submit a job, right, to uh, Dataflow, Right, uh, the the role, the IAM role that you have set for your account that is the, acting as the submitter, um, is you know what is checked uh, to see if you have the appropriate permissions to submit. Right. So for example, if I am submitting a data flow job, then this is usually done by like Rahul at myemail.com. Right. So we'll start with the user role, and then we'll also talk about the different service accounts. Right. So once a day, once a data flow job is launched. Right, it needs to act on its own. Right, the Beam pipeline, the Beam code needs to, you know, probably access different read, read uh, sources to read data. Right, data again to different things. So those are determined by the service accounts, and we'll see that as we proceed in this slide. So, with user roles, right, there are three common user roles that are predefined and available for you. Right, the first one is the data flow viewer role. Right. As it says, this is a read-only access to all of the data flow-related sources, right? So a user with this role cannot launch a job or cancel a job. But if there is a job running and all they want to do is monitor how the job is doing and look at the progression of your Beam pipeline, then the data flow view viewer is usually a very good role to do this, right? Um, the second role that we have is what we call data flow developer. Right, so Dataflow developer is a role with more permissions than a viewer. Right, you can you can view the jobs, you can look at the status of the jobs, and you can also update or cancel jobs. Right, so if you want to, you know, relaunch or update the existing pipeline, making a difference in like the pipeline options, you can do that via update. Or if you straight out just want to cancel the job, you can do that. Right, and the final final user role that is there, right, which I see most commonly used by folks who are like actively, you know, like launching the data flow jobs is the data flow admin, right? So the data flow admin has more permissions than the data flow developer. And the admin role is required to actually, you know, like create and launch the job, right? You can also do the management tasks like uh, updating or canceling of the job, but uh, admin is the only role which gives you the permissions to actually launch the job. Right. This is because when you do launch a job, right? Obviously, you submit the job to the Dataflow runner, right? Um, as mentioned in our first session on architecture, we might have touched upon the cloud storage element where you know the files, your code is staged, right? So the admin permission takes care that you know the code that you have for your Beam pipeline can be staged and made available to the runner, right? And then also you know like check that there are enough uh, that check that you have the it required like quota, for example, on compute engine to permit to provision the users that you uh, the, to provision the workers that will be running your B pipeline. So from the user accounts, we move on to service accounts. So I meant we mentioned two service accounts in the previous uh, slides, right? 
So the first one of them is the data flow service account and what we call as the orchestrator, right? So the way the service account usually looks is, you know, like service hyphen your project number at data flow service producer, so and so, right? Um, the way I like to think of think about this service account is um, in the architecture session earlier today for Dataflow, we might have mentioned uh, the regional endpoint that actually you know does the controlling of resources, assigning of work, and really does the management part of your uh, beam pipeline on Dataflow. So this service account is basically a service account that is controlled by that regional endpoint to do exactly the processes that I mentioned. Right? It is the one that checks and provisions the, the GCE workers for your pipeline, right? If it auto scales, it'll provision more workers and uh, does all of that. So you can think about it as, you know, like doing all of the, the tasks to make sure that your pipeline is up and running, right? It doesn't actually run or, you know, read from the source or thing that is not controlled by this pipeline, but it does all of the other process related tasks that is needed. Right. In general, this service account has the data flow service agent role by default in your project. The recommended step here is to actually not uh, tamper with the service account. It is a Google managed service account, and we recommend that you know you usually let that service account just be as is so that it can continue launching and provisioning the resources for your job. The next service account, which is, is called the controller service account, right? This is the service account that is actually assigned to the VMs or workers and uh, is, is what does the reading of data, you know, like, and writing of data in the sinks and all of that work, right? By default, it uses what we call the compute engine default service account, which is there in every Google Cloud project. But you also do have the ability to specify it while launching your job, right? Using pipeline options to use a custom service account or a service account of your own uh, for in place of the controller service account, right? So in that case, the default service account will not be default compute service account will not be used. And the service account that you actually specify is the one that is going to be, you know, um, doing the reading of data. So you want to make sure that if you do specify a service account, you give it the appropriate permissions so that it can read your data and similarly write the data to the sink as well, right? At minimum, we also require that the service account that you use also has the data flow worker role, which is another predefined role for data flow that is available in cloud. So that covered the permissions aspect and the permissions best practices that we have, right? We move on to the uh, networking aspect, right? And one of the big important like points to keep in mind with networking is often users while running beam pipelines on data flow try to use what we call a shared VPC, right? So this is where uh, your network, where your workers run is in a separate project, right? This can be due to multiple different reasons, right? Maybe the uh, maybe your organization has a separate networking team that manages all your networking resources. So you as a Beam developer might not really, you know, be managing that, but more leaving that to the networking team. So in this situations, they may have a network in a different project that they manage and control. But uh, since Dataflow is going to be using this different uh, network, right? We want to make sure that when you do set these, uh, when you do use these permissions, uh, when you do use this network, you have the right permissions set on it, right? So um, it is, you can use like custom or default networks, right? But one thing to keep in mind is when you are using a shared network, a network in a different project, that your service accounts, right? The data flow service account and controller service account have permissions, right? Like the compute network user permission on those networks so that like the service account can actually like provision use resources on that network for you and actually run the data flow job for you. So this is again, one of the key tip or one of the key things to keep in mind uh, when you, you know, like uh, use like a shared VPC. Another thing is uh, the number of VMs that you can prov provision is often dependent on the IP block size of the subnetwork that you're using, right? So you want to make sure that the network you use has a large enough IP block so that the v, like you can have enough VMs if you need spun up, right? Or your pipeline can auto scale to as many VMs as it needs, right? Or is set by the max number of workers. 
So this is again another key practice, right? So making sure that you have the right permissions and keeping in mind the IP block size of the network is really important here to make sure that your beam pipeline can run smoothly. One other important point that I that we like to talk about when it comes to uh, networking, especially, is configuring internet access. What we mean by this is um, your workers, right, that run for your Beam job, right? Uh, they need to be able to, you know, like have the right Beam container image installed on them, right? They need to be able to interact with the regional endpoint that we mentioned, right, so that they can get the required work from the regional endpoint, update the regional endpoint on the progress, and and things like that, right? So to do all of this, in general, the data flow workers that run your pipeline need to be able to reach the Google Cloud APIs and services, right? So that it can successfully start and execute the code. This is, again, a common mistake that is normally done on the networking side, where a certain firewall rule, for example, or the lack of a networking route to actually let the workers perform this communication can prevent the running of your pipeline and maybe cause pipeline failures, right? So by default, if you do not specify anything, uh, the, the, the workers that run your pipelines have public IPs. And uh, if the routes and firewall rules are set up correctly, then they will be able to contact these Google Cloud APIs, the Dataflow backend API, and actually run your job successfully and execute your job. However, if you do choose to, you know, for whatever requirement may be, use workers that only have private IPs, so they do not have a public IP, that is an extra step that you might need to take to ensure that your network that you're using has configured what we call private Google access to ensure that these workers that run your job, even with private IP, can talk to the Google Cloud APIs and services. Right. Um, so that's another key point here, is to make sure in general that these workers, whether they're using public or private IPs, have that ability to communicate with the backend services or Google Cloud APIs to execute your data flow job. So moving on, and as for the last point that we have today here on the networking side of things is uh, firewall rules, right? So when you run your Beam pipeline on data flow, it uses Google Compute Engine VMs, right? And these are simple VMs which have you know, the custom Beam image installed so that they can run your Beam pipeline. But a, a thing to keep in mind is, since these are simple VMs, you also want to make sure that restrictions that apply to normal VMs apply to these user data flow workers as well. right? So one of the common issues that we see is, as part of performing the operations or transforms in your Beam pipeline, these worker VMs will actually need to communicate with each other. Right. So to do this, uh, the Dataflow VMs have a standard port and protocol that they use. Right. So they usually communicate with each other. Right. So inter-worker communication normally happens on the TCP port. Uh, so on the TCP protocol, using ports one two three four five or one two three four six. Right. So if you are using a custom network and specifying custom firewall rules, and you do want to utilize uh, auto scaling in your pipeline, so you do have multiple workers, then it is recommended that you actually make sure that this requirement is satisfied. That is basically you do have a firewall rule that allows for this specific communication between those workers so that your data can be you know, shuffled between the workers as necessary. Right? A common symptom that we see when we might encounter this uh, inter-worker communication issue is an RPC deadline exceeded in cloud logging. Right, so as shown in the previous sessions today, the simple way to detect this is go into cloud logging and look at the logs for your data flow job and uh, check for error messages that might look like you know deadline exceeded while doing worker communication. Um, like I said, right, if you are not using a custom network, right, if you use the default network that comes in like every GCP project when you create it, um, that does automatically you know allow this interworker communication and uh, if if you you're if you're just continuing to use that default network there is nothing really that you need to do on your side 
But if you do decide to use a custom network or are modifying the network and firewall rules of that default network, then it is important to keep in mind that you do have this required firewall rule, right? So the link that is shown here in the slide should take you directly to like, you know, and give you like a simple like gcloud command that you can run uh, based to ensure or create this firewall rule in your network, right? So that's again, that's one of the final important points when it comes to the networking side of data flow to keep in mind. Okay, now that we've seen uh, uh, the different like permissions and networking issues, uh, we move on to our last, uh, you know, like section, which is the, some of the common error messages that we see in beam pipelines, especially while using the data flow runner, right? One of the common error messages that we see, right, which is normally seen, I would say, in batch jobs, uh, you know, and when you look at the reason for failure of a batch job, you could see an error message similar to what is shown in this slide, right? And it says the worker lost contact with the service, right? And you might see this message four different times, right? And they could be four, like the workers for each different time could be the same worker or different workers. But what this message usually indicates is that uh, one of, is that the worker that was performing or doing the work for your Beam pipeline was unable to contact the backend service, right, for Beam and provide updates, right? So if the worker is unable to talk to this backend, then it is then the regional endpoint or the backend is unable to facilitate and execute your job, and normally ends in the failure of your job that we see here, right? Um, this is a common or most of the times that we see this issue is because if you are running your Beam pipeline and processing a lot of data, but do not have a worker that is able to handle this, right? So let's say a small sized worker or a worker without enough memory, then, you know, like if the workers are CPU bound or memory bound, then this is when we see, these are the most common causes of the error message that we see in this slide, right? Um, moving on, I think that there are some predefined filters, right? Like the one that is currently shown, right? You can use this filter in your cloud logging for your job. And this should help you identify if your job did run into these memory issues, right? So basically, if you did see like out of memory exceptions uh, thrown by your workers for your pipeline, right? Uh, for if, if it was not an out of memory, but possibly a CPU bound pipeline, then you can try to investigate the CPU usage, right? So in the job metrics that you might have seen in the previous sessions today, you do see the CPU utilization of the workers that are running your pipeline. So you can check and see if your worker is continuously, you know, like being throttled at like 100, close to 100% CPU utilization, that is normally a sign that, you know, the worker is pushing its limits. So we ideally recommend 70 percent to 80 percent CPU utilization that means your workers are you know like not being overutilized not being underutilized but actually you know, performing optimally so this so you know looking into these different things right based on the error message that you see CPU or memory can help you identify uh, how to you know debug this issue and possibly avoid it right so uh, and the as it says right the simple solutions to avoid this issue right is maybe use workers that have more memory, so some of the high mem machines that are provided in GCP, or if it's more of a CPU issue, right, then use larger workers with more vCPUs um, that can actually process the amount of data that you are uh, doing in your pipeline. So the next and the last error message that we're gonna look at here is the processing stuck or operation ongoing in step uh, error message that we see, right? I think this is a pretty common um, error message that we see in Beam pipelines, right? And honestly, to read through and to look at this message is uh, the simplest way to interpret this is to actually uh, look at what it exactly says, right? What this means is that there has been a single operation, right, within your Beam pipeline that has been running for over X minutes, right? So uh, in the Dataflow runner, I think we the Dataflow runner automatically monitors the time an operation takes, right? And if an operation takes a long time, right? Maybe off, maybe five minutes or more, that is normally longer than we expect. So you, you start seeing these error messages in cloud logging for the pipeline. And uh, the general recommendation here is to interpret the stack trace or the trace pack for, the, for this error message, 
and try to see which part of the code or service is actually throwing this error, right? Uh, no, some common occurrences, right? So normally I see, we see this happening for like two functions that you might have as part of your pipeline code, right? Uh, some common best practices that I normally recommend here is if you see this happening for like you know an API call that you're making as part of your do function, right? Uh, make sure that you have timeouts and retries with like exponential backoffs included in your do function for those API calls, so that you know like it is not stuck, right? Or there is no RPC that is just stuck. But that is one common recommendation. I would say similarly for some of our I/O transforms, right? Um, I/O transform should come with like retry settings that you can set as for the I/O transforms. And I normally recommend that you do that as well. So this again is a very common error message that we see, right? But is um, it, it's usually very straightforward in terms of identifying what the issue is and how to actually work on resolving it. And uh, I think if you do, if none of the above recommendations, right, help you, then you can always try to use like a profiler or something to understand which part of your code particularly is you know consuming more time more resources and accordingly you know try to optimize that step so the final slide that we have for today is just something called like the dataflow recommender that comes as part of your uh, be your dataflow runner for your beam pipelines right and as part of your logs right you do have a tab called the diagnostics tab right and something that has been included is you know if we see error messages that are common like the ones that I just described previously like the operation ongoing uh, or you know like out of memory issues then what we try to do is in the diagnostic step not just show the error message but also include possible root causes right or the most common root cause or you know like give a better interpretation of those error messages right so based on these interpretations and based on the recommendations provided here you can you know perform debugging of your pipeline right maybe use higher memory machines if it's something like out of memory or you know like look into the code if you know a certain do function or something is stuck so that's so with that i think that's pretty much all we have for the last session today here for beam college so once again thank you all for attending and uh, thank you all for all of the participation that we've had and really hope that this has been useful for you thank you